All right, we're live. All right. Let's go ahead and get started here. Good to see you guys this evening. Um, I guess the one announcement again will still be regarding spring break. So we will not have class April 1st. That will be our spring break week. Then we'll resume the following week. So uh, that, I think that's the day after Easter. So that actually works out really nice for us, I think. So. Um, so don't come on April 1st. We won't be here. All right. Chapter 18, we've made it to. I'm going to move this. Sorry, I just get very particular about that. Uh, all right. You'll recall uh, chapters 14 to 17 was this farewell discourse. And that included the high priestly prayer, which we studied last week. And Jesus has had now his last moments alone with his disciples. Judas has already left their midst uh, to perform his act of betrayal against Jesus. And during these last few chapters, we've seen really moments of peace and intimacy that Jesus had with his beloved disciples. And now a transition is taking place. The next three chapters, 18, 19, and 20, uh, will cover the trials of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. And all four of the Gospels follow a similar pattern in the way in which they uh, tell the accounts of Jesus' life. And they all culminate the same way, with this same three-day period in which Jesus was crucified and then in which he rose from the dead. And that's because this is the essential material for the Christian. Uh, and that's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of these eyewitnesses, they wanted us to know. As usual, John's gospel takes a slightly different uh, approach than the other three gospels with a little bit of additional information and some unique angles uh, and storytelling. But the main point of each is crystal clear that Jesus was unjustly crucified, that he died, he was buried, and then he rose again. You cannot write a gospel of Jesus without including all of this essential material because it's at the very core of the gospel message. So tonight uh, we'll cover John 18, 1 to 14. Is Jesus arrested? Will be the first division. And then the second division is John 18, 15 to 27. Jesus before Annas. <clears throat> before Annas. So for John... His storytelling or his telling of the passion narrative very clearly displays one thing, and that, that is that Jesus is in control of his own destiny, and he is, he is acting in accordance with God's plan. So I will be tonight, I will be deliberate at pointing that out in the moments where it's very clear that it demonstrates that Jesus is in total control. For, for most of us, there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in studying the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. It's very meaningful to us. It's uh, essential to our being. We experience pain and sorrow along with Jesus and his disciples as we read these texts. And we experience emptiness and loss as Jesus is in the grave for three days. And then we experience joy and astonishment as Jesus is raised to new life. And there's not a single moment where these things have become out of control for Jesus. He has known the plan from the beginning, and it is to do his Father's will. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have eternally been completely united in their plan for the redemption of the world. Yet at the cross, Jesus substitutes himself in our place to pay for the sins of those who trust in him. Yet this was never done with hesitation. Jesus never feels sorry for himself. Acts of great love are never done with regret. In fact, it was for the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. At the start of it, chapter 18, Jesus has finished praying and he's on the move. It says he crossed the Kidron Valley. You have that map in the... Um, in, in like your, your uh, study booklets there, um, you can see the Kidron Valley there. It's essentially a creek or a ditch that's just to the east of the city walls of Jerusalem. 
uh, it's interesting. Second Samuel uh, 15, 23 mentions that King David also crossed the Kidron Valley. And he did so when he was being chased by Absalom, who was betraying him. So he was also experiencing betrayal the time that he crossed the Kidron Valley. And on the other side of the valley was a, a garden, or what John calls a garden. Other Gospels call this Gethsemane, which means olive press. And this was the Mount of Olives, or a grove, or an orchard of olive trees. Well, next, Judas arrives. Remember when we last saw Judas, this was chapter 13. Jesus had told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. And here's an example of seeing Jesus in control. He knows he's about to be betrayed. And instead of trying to stop the events, he tells Judas to go and do it. And then Jesus gave him enough time to accomplish the betrayal. And now that Judas has had that time, Jesus went to a place where Judas could easily find him. Isn't that amazing? Why would Jesus go to the Mount of Olives? Why would he go to a place where Judas knew he liked to hang out? Again, this shows that Jesus was in complete control and that he was willingly giving himself over. He didn't go to a place where Judas couldn't find him. He went somewhere where it was uh, easy for him to be found. It's also possible that this place was easier for him to uh, be captured, making it less likely that his disciples would be put at any risk. Uh, also interesting that the very first time that man ever betrayed God was in a garden. And God writes the very best stories, so there is something beautiful yet tragic about the symbolism with Jesus also being betrayed in a garden. Judas led the way for the chief priests and the Pharisees, as well as a detachment of Roman soldiers to come and capture Jesus. The Romans and the Pharisees hated each other. They were always at odds, but in Jesus, they found a common enemy, which united them. They had their torches and their lanterns and their weapons. How could Jesus and his disciples possibly defend themselves against all of this? Well, Jesus doesn't try to defend himself because he knows that the hour has come. Verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus stepped forward. This wasn't going to be a big fight. Jesus knew all that was going to happen. He was in complete control. And verse 5 tells us, who they want. They want Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus then said, I am he. I am he. In Greek, this is ego in me, which is sometimes translated, it is I. But more literally can be translated, I am. And we've seen this before. In John chapter 6, Jesus was walking on the water out to his frightened disciples, and he said, it is I. Same thing, ego e me. And then the boat immediately reached the shore. In John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus was facing accusations from the Pharisees. And Jesus said, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins if you did not believe that I am he. Ego in me, same thing. You will indeed die in your sins. And then again in John 8, 28, Jesus said, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. Ego in me. So this is very compelling. Because God told Moses at the burning bush in the book of Exodus to call Him, I am. Is Jesus saying, I am? In all these circumstances, is he saying, I am the great I am? Well, there's some textual interpretation things that are way above my understanding. But some scholars say, yes, that's exactly what he's saying. And some say, probably not. But it is compelling. And here's what's not up for debate. Jesus is God. He is the great I am. So whether or not Jesus is specifically saying that in these circumstances, 
It is true. He is I am in the Exodus sort of sense. It, it's not quite as important as believing what John has, or, or, I'm sorry, it is important for us to believe what John has taught us from the beginning. That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But notice back in John chapter 18 what happens when Jesus says, Ego e me, in verse 6. When Jesus said, I am He, they drew back and fell to the ground. Who drew back and fell to the ground? Well, it seems that it was the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the detachment of Roman soldiers. And this moment's also highly debated. What happens in it? You can read about it in the notes. The BSF notes don't take a real strong stance on this. But um, some think that the chief priests and the Pharisees fell to the ground sort of as a knee-jerk reaction when they heard this holy name, I am, spoken. So it was almost like a worshipful response. But Others point out that, well, why would the Roman soldiers fall to the ground? They don't have respect for God's name in the same way that the chief priests would have. They never would have fallen to the ground and worship just at the mention of God's name. And therefore, maybe this is uh, what's called a theophany, which is an appearance or manifestation of God to humans, which results in fear or awe. Jesus says, I am. He self-identifies as the great I am, and when he does so, a small glimpse of the power of God is released. And because of the power of God's presence or the power that Jesus possessed, these torches and these lanterns and these weapons of the Roman detachment prove themselves to be worthless against the great I am. If they really knew the power of God, it's laughable that they would bring soldiers and weapons at all. So we can assume that after falling over, they stand up, and brush themselves off. And then Jesus again asks them in verse 7, who is it that you want? They want Jesus of Nazareth. Again, Jesus is still in control. He is leading the line of questioning. They came to get him, yet he came out to them and began to question them. At his word... They were knocked over. From a human perspective, it appears that everything is unraveling for Jesus. But from God's perspective, everything is going as planned. Verse 8, Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. You remember reading that in John 6, 39. I shall lose none of those. The Father has given me. Now you may ask, what about Judas? Wasn't he lost? Yes, he was, but he had never really been found to begin with. Judas had never been given to Jesus by the Father in the same way. He was not a true disciple or a true sheep. Jesus was caring for the disciples like a good shepherd. He was giving of himself and was keeping them out of harm's way. Peter didn't like what was happening. He pulls out a sword. He cuts off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Jesus is not there for a fight. The fight will not happen in the garden, but will happen at the cross. And Jesus will not resist, but will willingly give himself up. And you see also in verse 11, then that Jesus is in control because he commands Peter to put away his sword. Jesus was in control. He was not afraid of these Roman guards. The Synoptic Gospels, the other three Gospels, include more information about Jesus' time in prayer at the Mount of Olives, specifically his prayer, his famous prayer, not my will, but yours be done. But John includes this declaration from Jesus, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Jesus has resolved himself indeed to drink the cup that the Father had given him. And what does this mean? What does it mean to drink the cup the Father had given him? Well, the cup is frequently in Scripture a symbol of God's wrath. As Job 21.20 says, a wicked person is said to drink the cup of the wrath of the Almighty. 
Psalm 75, 8 says, In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to the very dregs. The dregs is that last little bit of thick liquid or sediment that's at the bottom. And unless you tilt the cup all the way over, all the way back, and make it get that last drop, you don't get the dregs. And such is the wrath of God that is poured out on the wicked. Every last drop will be applied. The weight of the wrath of God is so intense, it is staggering. It causes a complete disorientation of the body and the mind, a stupor and a confusion like that of drunkenness. This is how the Bible describes the dreadfulness and agony of God's wrath. This will come up again next year in Revelation 14.10. It says, The wicked will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of His wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. In Revelation 16, God's judgment is depicted as the pouring out of seven bowls of God's wrath upon the earth. It is staggering and mind-numbing, agonizing, and dreadful to be under the wrath of God. In our natural state, that is the fate of humanity. The face, or to face, the wrath of God. It's because of sin. Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God, and so every human has done the same. Adam and Eve were offered life for obedience to God. And instead, they were given death for their disobedience to God. And this is the just nature of God. Disobedience is sin. Sin leads to death. Sin will not and cannot be ignored by God. And God will not leave sin unpunished. But notice what happens in John chapter 18. Jesus tells Peter to put his sword away. And then he says, shall I not Drink the cup the Father has given me. Jesus is stepping forward to willingly be bound and captured, knowing exactly what would happen to him. You remember John 4, 34, when Jesus said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And this is what Jesus is doing. And this demonstrates the great love of God. The fact that all sin leads to death and separation from God and all sin will be punished by the wrath of God demonstrates the justice of God. Would God be God if he didn't stamp out evil? But what happens at the cross demonstrates the great love of God. Where it was the plan of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit before the earth was even created that Jesus would substitute himself in the place of sin. And notice that Jesus is captured rather than Peter. It would have done no good for humanity if Peter would have been taken to the cross. Peter was a sinner just like you and me, but Jesus, he's the light of the world. He's the good shepherd. He's the resurrection and the life. He's perfect and sinless, and God incarnate. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, the payment for sin required the shedding of blood. There is no shedding of blood. There is no forgiveness of sins because animal sacrifices were offered on behalf of the people to atone for their sins, to clear their name before God. Isaiah 53 speaks of the Messiah being led like a lamb to the slaughter. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Hebrews 9.28, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. 1 Peter 2.24, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. When we speak of substitution, we speak of Jesus being punished for the sins of those he saves. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. 
It is uh, in his justice, God does not leave sin unpunished. And in his love, Jesus was punished in our place. We ought to feel the agony of living in a sinful world. We know what heartache feels like. We know what disappointment feels like. We know hardship and we know tragedy. We know wickedness and we know evil. Sin is destructive and it is brutal and it is the worst of all masters. In Revelation chapter 5, in one of John's visions, he's weeping. John is weeping. He's in pain and he's in in despair because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Since the Garden of Eden, no one has been worthy. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, there was one worthy. Revelation 5, 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. From Revelation 5, 12. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. The lamb was slain, and because of that is triumphant. The lamb has triumphed over sin and death. Jesus took the cup of God's wrath and drank it to the dregs. He tipped it over, and he shook the cup to get every last drop, fully atoning for the sins of those who trust in him. His life for yours. He became cursed for us, giving his life as a ransom for many. God's justice satisfied and his love never displayed more brilliantly. So they arrested Jesus. They bound him as if that would actually stop his power. And they brought him to Annas. First principle. Jesus willingly faced the judgment of God on behalf of his people. Jesus willingly faced the judgment of God on behalf of his people. I hope that in reading this passage, you are completely convinced that Jesus was not overpowered in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went there on his own accord and gave himself over. Why? Because he had been sent to do the will of the Father, to satisfy the justice of God and to display the love of God. Christ is the victor. The Lamb has triumphed over sin and death on your behalf. Do you know Jesus in this way? Have you turned from your sin and submitted yourself to the Lordship of the only one who is worthy? How does understanding Jesus' willing sacrifice give you confidence to live for him today? The last half of our lesson today has this very interesting contrast between things that are happening simultaneously. Jesus is facing intense persecution and he remains courageous and faithful. At the same time, Peter is facing weak accusations and he demonstrates his weakness. In verses 13 to 14, we saw that Jesus was brought to Annas, who had previously been the high priest. It would be a little bit confusing sometimes, but um, Annas had been the high priest from A.D. 6 to A.D. 15. Uh, Jesus' death, I think, somewhere around A.D. 33. So it's been a few years, but uh, it's clear he still continued to have influence. And in fact, historical records show that Not only was Annas the high priest, but at least five of his sons became high priest. And then his son-in-law also held the office. And 
at one time or another. And that's, um, that's who is in power right now is Caiaphas. Uh, the, he's the son-in-law of Annas. But Annas was removed by the Romans, which the Jews wouldn't have liked. And so he still had power, and people probably thought in a lot of ways that he really was the rightful high priest. And so it's not surprising then that they would bring Jesus to him first. But here in chapter 18, Caiaphas is the one holding the actual title of high priest. Um, Caiaphas was the one who had said it would be good if one man died for the people. As Christians, we know that's exactly what Jesus did. Uh, It seemed maybe that was prophetic when he said that earlier in John, or maybe it simply showed his bias that he thought Jesus should be put to death. Well, we read that Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. This unnamed disciple is very likely to be John, the author of this gospel. John was able to get access to the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside. And in John's passion narrative, there's like this inside outside sort of shifting of the scenes of what happens. Jesus is inside, and Peter's on the outside, but Peter wants to get on the inside. A servant girl questions Peter, You aren't one of the disciples, too, are you? Peter replied, I am not. It's denial number one. We're told that it was cold, which is unusual for this time of year. So Peter warmed himself by the fire. The scene shifts to the house inside. Jesus is questioned by the high priest about two things. Those two things are about his disciples and about his teaching. We don't get all the details of their line of questioning, but likely the questioning was regarding his, what his disciples um, had to do with the size of his following and any uh, potential for any conspiracies or uprisings. The question regarding his teaching was over theological concerns. Theological concerns still mattered to the Jewish religious leaders. They opposed Jesus because he claimed to be the Son of God, as we'll see in chapter 19, verse 7. However, they will eventually present the case to the Romans trying to make Jesus look like an insurrectionist. Because that is what would have been really meaningful to the Romans. But here's Jesus' response. Uh, Verse 20. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Notice that Jesus doesn't really mention the disciples. That was their first line of questioning. And despite being asked about them, he leaves them out of this in order to protect them. He's determined not to lose any of those that God had given him. He's the good shepherd protecting his disciples, even as he is the lamb headed to the slaughter. But regarding his teaching, Jesus explains He didn't have one message that he gave to his disciples in private and then something totally different that he would share in public. His messages were unified and he said, go ask the people. And throughout these trials, there's many examples of the leaders not following their own procedural rules. And one of those is that it may have been illegal to question the defendant directly. Instead, they were supposed to question the other witnesses. So in some way, Jesus is probably pointing this out and Uh, pointing out that they weren't following their own rules. And so this result, as a result of this, Jesus gets slapped in the face. Yet Jesus is unfazed in verse 23. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Jesus is then sent from Annas to Caiaphas and the shift or the scene shifts back outside. It says, meanwhile, you know, it reminds me of like a, one of those old TV Western shows where it's like, meanwhile. But these things are happening simultaneously. Inside, Jesus is demonstrating tremendous courage and tremendous resolve as he is being wrongfully accused by these religious leaders of the land. And outside, here's Peter. He's still standing by the fire and he's asked again, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? I am not, he says, which is denial number two. And then a servant 
of the high priest. This is not a high-ranking official. This is a servant. Questions Peter. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? And Peter denied it again. And the rooster began to crow, just as Jesus had said. This contrast between Jesus and Peter is almost impossible to miss because Jesus is courageous and faithful and Peter is anything but. Even the lowest of the low in the land are too much for Peter to stand up against. Peter had shown either stupidity or valor or ignorance when he cut off the servant's ear, somehow thinking that he could save Jesus. Then we read denial after denial, and it is clear that Peter couldn't save Jesus. He needed Jesus to save him. Peter couldn't step forward and be the atoning sacrifice. Only Jesus could do that. And Jesus was fully willing because Jesus knew all that was going to happen to him. And he didn't shy away from it. He knew that he would be crucified that he would be the lamb led to the slaughter to satisfy the justice of God and so doing, lovingly draw believers to himself, saving them from their sins. Second principle, Jesus is the model of love and courage for believers. Jesus is the model of love and courage for believers. So I help coach my son's fifth grade basketball team in my spare time. And one of the goals that we've had as coaches this year is we have seen our older kids go into seventh grade basketball and it be a mess. Seventh grade basketball can be crazy because for the first time they're wearing their actual school jerseys, you know, and they're representing their own school. And they take a bus together to another school and they get there and there's cheerleaders there, which is almost too much for a seventh grade boy to handle. And teams can press and they can trap and they can double team and the refs are calling travels now consistently and hopefully fouls sometimes um, more closely than ever before. And the kids get thrown into this environment for the first time and it's just overwhelming. So you try to prepare them, you know, to like, Be strong with the ball and how to like face up and look before you start just putting your head down and dribbling into a group of people. We tell them uh, to call out screens and play help side defense and, and run the play that we call. It's a lot to prepare for seventh grade basketball. Well, how are you preparing to stand strong for Christ? When the guards showed up, Peter got excited And he traveled, you know, it just, the moment got the best of him. Then he gets trapped in the corner and he dribbles the ball off his foot like three times in a row. I'm not in any way implying that Jesus denying Christ is the same as dribbling off your foot. I mean, this, this is a huge, much bigger deal, but he wasn't prepared. He wasn't prepared. So how ready are you? You aren't one of Jesus' disciples too, are you? At work, at home, with your family, are you courageously standing with Christ? At times in our world, it seems like it's becoming increasingly hostile to the gospel. Is that impacting your behavior? How are you preparing yourself? Jesus protected his disciples. He loved them to the end. He did not waver in the face of opposition. This week, or as the situation worsens and deteriorates from here, he will not waver. And we will never be Jesus. But this is who we are called to follow. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We are to follow Christ. His substitutionary atonement purchased our redemption. It purchased our freedom to follow Christ with courageousness. No longer are we slaves to sin. We are slaves to righteousness. So how are you preparing yourself to stand strong for Jesus in difficult circumstances? You must never forget that Jesus went to the cross in your place, 
Therefore, he is worthy of your total allegiance. Let's pray. Lord, this is just the beginning of the what we get to study these next few weeks, really leading up to Easter. What a perfect way for us to prepare our hearts and mind for this time of year. Thank you that we get to study it with one another, that we get to spend time alone with our Bibles and read the words of Christ. We see Jesus willingly giving himself over and understanding the incredible implications that has for humanity and for us as individuals. And I pray that our commitment and our devotion and our faithfulness to you would grow as we see the beauty of Christ displayed in these next few chapters. Thank you for these men and ask you to be with them in their weeks ahead. In Christ's name, amen. Don't forget to get cupcakes.